wide awake. Side by side on my piano, why don't we? Followed by a classic concert performance by Bob Marley from the film Reggae Sunsplash, featuring hits like Get Up, Stand Up, and No Woman, No Cry as well as an interview with Cheap Trick, who talk about their experiences on the road and their latest video, If You Want My Love and She's Tight. FMTV also presents flashbacks to 1951 with Nat King Cole performing I Love You for Sentimental Reasons and Duke Ellington playing his original version of Sophisticated Lady, plus Astonishing Odyssey, a laser symphony featuring the music from Star Wars and 2001. So open your eyes, open your ears, open all your senses, and move freely into the new age of television. FMTV is brought to you by Mars Bar. Taste those crunchy nuts. Mars Bar makes you feel sunny inside. Lightning bug and my rock and roll invasion of Earth is underway. Look at them. They'll be rock and roll. They'll all shake and dance. You're a genius, oh terrible master. There's no end to your evil. It was a case of being at the right place at the right time. In America, morale was a bit sluggish following Kennedy's assassination, and popular music was overrun by an assortment of prepackaged teen idol clones. For the hundreds of thousands of war babies, now in their teens, something was due to break the monotony, anything. And then the Beatles came along. America took the Fab Four to heart and later took a lot more. But their arrival was a cause for celebration and the beginning of Beatlemania. What do you think of the Beatles? I think they're fantastic. I've been a fan for 17 years, but since I was about three years old. Their music, it appeals to everybody. Their music will always go on forever. Every generation will keep recycling. The Beatles were an inspiration to an untold number of youths, some of whom even grew up to be musicians. They were the first band that I remember seeing. And when I, when I saw them, yeah, they played, they played their instruments, they wrote their songs, and they were self-contained, and they were a bunch of kids up having a good time. I remember watching them at Ed Sullivan, and I didn't even know what a guitar was then, and I said, well, that's what I want to do. Yeah. Besides musicians, the Beatles were particularly inspiring to merchandising firms, producing anything that could hold a label. Beatlemania had become a social and economic phenomenon. Vince Gabarini and Lester Bangs, two leading rock critics, remember the group as something more than and four mop-haired musicians. Let's just say that a certain potential that we all had, a potential for getting deeper into ourselves, for beginning to come out into contact to each other as a community, a precursor of what was going to happen later in the 60s and what may have partially died in the 70s, came into us almost within one week when the Beatles arrived. It was a mass enlightenment. It was people waking up to something inside. What they're waking up to really was their own potential. As far as Beatlemania is concerned, Lester Bangs has a different opinion than one might expect. I think if it hadn't been the Beatles, it would have been somebody else. You know, I think that it was a great moment. It should, you know, just be left at that. And, and I think that, you know, the nostalgia for it and this obsessive living in the past and, and, and you know, Beatlemania in 1981 is, is sick. It's basically that nothing is going on right now and people are desperate and 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 there's a giant nostalgia industry as you all know and as far as i'm concerned beatlemania is just like happy days it's a ripoff and guess who pays the consumer and john lennon the beatles appeared in a number of films a couple of them help and hard day's night were produced by walter shinson because of the public's demand, he's reissuing Hard Day's Night 17 years after its initial release. We all know the Beatles are uh, probably the most successful, popular show business phenomenon of all time. And uh, I'm glad the movies hold up because um, there are new generations of youngsters who haven't seen the Beatles. They're 
people who are coming to see this movie now who weren't born when we made the movie. And they're young, and their teens they are not that young. They're growing up. So that I think that there will always be an audience for this movie. Excuse me. Have you seen that little old man? We've broken out now. The blessed freedom of it all. Have you got a nail file? These hand clocks are killing me. I was saying they're innocent. I don't want to go. Sorry for disturbing you, girls. I bet you can't guess what I was in for. John Lennon was the focus of the group. He was the leader and really the first member to come to grips with the grand illusion of Beatlemania. But it was too late. What happens with the consumer culture we're in is that people immediately spoil it or take it the wrong way. And the Beatles themselves did. Now, the thing that Lennon, of course, did say in his last interviews was, he said, I thought I was Elvis Beatle. I lived in this illusion of egoism, this giant eagle bubble that I built up. And he said, you know, it's always the courtiers who kill the king. He said, it was my friend. Everybody wanted to feed off this image. He said the same thing over and over again, and nobody would listen to him. He said, please, look, I'm just a guy. You know, I'm just, I'm not... John Lennon Beatle or John Lennon Guru or John Lennon Great Leader. I'm just a guy that, that, that writes songs, and please accept me that way. And people absolutely refuse to. And I think Mark David Chapman is the ultimate Beatle maniac. We got it tomorrow morning we mastered. Or uh, tomorrow morning didn't come, but next morning. Jack Douglas, Lennon's producer for Imagine and Double Fantasy, remembers the final session. So after we... After we finished that night, we said, okay, nine o'clock in the morning, Sterling Sound, let's, we're gonna master this. It's, we really dug it. With, and uh, so, get in the elevator, 10 o'clock, and see you tomorrow. And it was like 15 minutes later, I got a phone call. It was a disaster, but it was a good day before that. But such a person was John that his old friends never forgot him. Original Beatle drummer Pete Best remembers. He was shot dead, finished, you know. As far as John Lennon was concerned, there was no more. Um, it, it hurt me deep down. Okay, I know people turned around and said, you haven't seen him for 20 years. Okay. Uh, but at that present moment in time, my memory sort of flooded back to the, the fun times I'd had with John. You know, we fought together, we laughed together, drank together, whatever else we did together, you know. Um, and I just couldn't believe it. You know, it was a tragedy. It really was. Let me take you down, cause I'm going to. Strawberry Fields was first a dream that only John Lennon could see. Then, through Lennon's gift, it became a vision shared by millions. Today, Strawberry Fields has been brought to reality in New York's Central Park, across the street from the Dakota. Arnie Abramowitz, who conceived of the park design with Yoko Ono, describes how the park came to be. I currently work for the Parks Department. Yoko Ono wrote a letter to the mayor asking if, something, if she could do something to help Strawberry Fields since it was named in honor of John Lennon. And soon after, I drew up some plans, and then I met with Yoko. It's very important to her in that, one, it's, it's her front yard. Um, a building is across the street. Uh, John and Yoko took their last walk together here in Strawberry Fields. On the other side of the country, sculptor Brett Livingstone Strong created his own tribute to John Lennon, a life-size bronze statue located in front of the Los Angeles City Hall. I found that I saw John Lennon as a man who, more than a musician, but stood up as a significant individual who inspired the world in many different fields, whether it was scientists researching some formula, whether it was an artist endeavoring to create something, it inspired me to, to bother to create a significant statue, which I believe he himself stands as a man who represents the period from the 60s to the 1980s, and so that representation I portrayed through the stance. I spent seven months trying to portray the, that feeling of, of John Lennon. John's feelings did not die with him. Former Beatle Paul McCartney and superstar Stevie Wonder sing of racial harmony in Ebony and Ivory.
Stay tuned, FM TV will continue with Bob Marley. FM TV now continues with Bob Marley. This rare footage was taken from the film Reggae Sunsplash, which was shot in 1979 and directed by Stephen Paul at the Reggae Sunsplash Festival in Montego Bay, Jamaica. Bob Marley was born on April 6, 1945 in Roden Hall, Jamaica. His father, an English army officer, died while Marley was young and his family moved to Trenchtown in the poor section of Kingston. His first group, the Whalers, had people like Peter Tosh and Burning Spear, now established artists themselves. With his group, the Whalers, Bob Marley helped to shape and direct the growth of reggae music. The shanty towns, trench town and ghost town. The jungle grew up literally on a dump of trash and human waste. In Jamaica from the beginning, reggae was slum music and was disdained by all but the lowest classes of black society. Reggae means regular people who are suffering and don't have what they want. Reggae means coming from people, like everything from the ghetto, from majority. The roots of reggae music are fixed in slavery. Jamaica's cities and towns pump along to the sound of reggae. Its mentor and rude boy's origins gave it a crude and antisocial air. With the beaten threat of violence projected by the Rudies. Rudies were young men, aged between 14 and 30, who had joined the migration from country to Kingston. With no skills and West Kingston's chronic 35% unemployment rate, the Rudies redefined street life, hanging out, suffering, flicking deadly ratchet knives, trolley hopping, purse snatching, occasional muggings, petty theft from insolence, ganja, singing and general hooliganism into lifetime careers, most of which ended very early. For the Rudy, the only way out of the West Kingston, Trenchtown, Tivoli Gardens, Coast Town, Jonestown, Denham Town, was via a hit single or police bullet. Like the Slickers, Johnny Too Bad, or Jimmy Cliff as Ivan, the harder they come. Kingston is a city of fires, a city on fire. Rastafarians and the police are still carrying on their own war. The police is checking cars in traffic jams for ganja and illegal weapons daily. Rastafarians, the rude boys, the sufferers, and reggae. A squalid place to sit around doing nothing, waiting for the pressure to drop. The place from trench down rock and rebel music. FMTV will continue with Bob Marley and more. This is Rick Nielsen from Cheat Trick. In just a little minute, we're going to see some Limburger cheese stories. We're talking with Cheap Trick. On the left, John Brandt. In the middle, Rick Nielsen. And on the right, Robin Zander. But where's Bunny Carlos? Bunny, please get well. Bunny, last night cooked his own food, got sick. He'd never done it before. So he's going back to his regular cheeseburger haunch and uh, munched down on the things he should. But uh, Bunny, get well. We'll see you on tour. 
Oh, that was sweet. We would all like to know what your origins are, where you're from, how and where you met, and how long you've been together. Want to do it one at a time? <laughs> John, we'll start with you. Ah, uh, let's see. Cheap Truck's been together since 1973. Has a very good year for uh, wine and the champagne, uh, actually. Uh, 73, yeah. We started playing clubs all over Chicago and places like that. And at that time, it was Tom Peterson, Bunny Carlos, Robin Zander, and me. And uh, we've evolved from through the, the years. From the Homo sapiens species of um, somewhere around uh, 2000. B.C. or something like that. No, not those aren't. No. <laughs> oh. How long have we been together? Seven years? No, no. Eight we've been years? together since uh, nine, years. nine years. Nine years this year. And uh, we've put our first record out in 1977, recorded in 76, and uh, we have our seventh album out right now. It's called One on One. And our latest addition to this combo is Mr. John Brandt. And he's over on my right and on your left. How do you work when you're writing? Do all four of you work together? Do you pair off? Do you have any special method? I think the method we use is we pencil all write... Pencil and paper. <laughs> uh, pencil and paper, and we, and we all write individually. And then we get together. And then we put it together. And uh, I bring my ideas to Robin, he brings his ideas to me, and we piece them together, and uh, somehow we end up with songs. Uh, like on our latest record. Oh, oh. Excuse me. Oh, I'm listening for this. There, because we, we took your picture. We're waiting for that. To, uh, the latest record, we did 35 songs. We wrote, yeah, wrote about 35 songs and then cut it down to 11 for the album for one-on-one. -on -one. And when we originally went into the studio, we only had 12 songs. And so we wrote most of them in the studio. And out of those original 12, we only used three or four, I think, that are on the record. And so it meant we did a lot of writing in the studio. As well as being popular, your sound has a very strong music line. When did you decide to be serious musicians instead of <laughs> just loud, flashy pizzazz? Is that, is that what we were before? Is that what you're saying? No, oh. I'm saying as opposed to. I think we're still deciding that. <laughs> we haven't made the final commitment. I think rock music should be fun, and uh, I think we're, we definitely try to do, have as much of that as possible. We like to tour a lot, and uh, as far as being professional musicians, it sounds uh, sounds like a violin player with a New York uh, orchestra. I think we're we're serious about what we do. But at the same time, uh, it's the best job in the world. I think because we do what we like. That was another one of my questions, and I guess you answered it. The question oh. was, is it all still fun? Or are you getting tired of it? It's not all fun. No, it's a lot of hard work. And say like uh, we have a tour that will last anywhere from three to five to seven and our actually our longest tour was 18 months in a row so it's, it's a lot of work but uh, each night getting a reaction from a nice audience like you makes it uh, very worthwhile and it's a lot of fun speaking of touring and audiences you guys have broken all records in japan what we want to know is what's the difference between japanese and american audiences is there a difference it's more japanese in the audience in where in Japan. Oh, and that's it? That's outside, it. Of, outside of San Francisco, yeah. yeah. I'd say just, you know, rock music is like the universal language. Uh, in Japan, kids take English in school so they can speak it. And, but rock and roll music is like uh, English in France is popular, and English in Russia, China, because uh, most of the, uh, the rock music of today and of the past is with the English spoken word. It makes it good for us because I can only speak Ekenspreken Deutsch. And who wants to make German records? Like? The Germans. Well, Udo Hindenburg, Udo um. Jurgens, and all these guys. And Heino. Heino. Oh, he's a real talent. I'm sure that our viewers would just love to hear a really interesting road story. Well, I have a paternity suit going right now. I was attacked by. 14 girls in Wichita, Kansas. And they took advantage of me. They whipped me. They hurt me. They abused me. I loved it. But you got pregnant. Oops. Well, the baby was born and was holding the IUD. Have you ever heard that story? That's true. Most outrageous present for Robin came. It was a, a year ago Christmas, 
and UPS package showed up at the door. <laughs> Out jumped this stinky girl. She'd been in there for six days. <laughs> Are you serious? Uh, serious. I don't know. Uh, it was from Seattle. She came from Seattle and showed up at her offices in Wisconsin. And she was naked, and she had a canteen and a couple sandwiches, and she was really funky smelling. Sent herself to Robin. I mean, how expensive is that to go UPS? And it was blue label, too, and it was awful slow. I guess it was the Christmas rush. And depended but on But it was much. COD, too, so it was, <laughs> it was even worse. Yeah. I had to pay the postman. Huh? You could have refused it. I wanted to, but she was kind of good looking. <laughs> Hi, this is Bunny Carlos from Cheap Trick. I'm not here right now, but I will be soon. When I take off my mask, when I take off my sweater, and I join you. Ooh. Which came first? Did the audience you play to influence your songs, or did you get your audience because of what you said? No, we wrote songs before we had an audience. We used to play clubs and play schools and things like that. And I remember we played once out in Minot, North Dakota, and we had three people there. It was one guy was an Indian, of Indian origin, and there were, uh, one was the bartender, bartendress, big, big fat lady. She she was the one with the decibel meter. Yeah, she used to carry a decibel meter to tell us to turn it down. She had threatened, or she said we killed her dog too, right. trying to not pay us. And then the third person was the guy that was hitting this Indian with a pool cue. <laughs> and that's a true story. It's and that true. was in Minot, North Dakota. <laughs> And so, our music came before our audience. <laughs> we came before our audience, the one they come to see us. Who's been your strongest influence? That girl with the, had the Limburger <laughs> stink on her. Ooh, musically, UPS girl. musically. Oh, musically. Yeah. Well, you have to make it a little clear, you know. We're, Who's been your strongest influence musically? Probably different people for every one of us here. Yeah. Okay, let's try one at a time. Who do you want to start with? How about me? Okay, musically, uh, because I grew up, and I'm still growing up, my parents were opera singers, and I used to hear a lot of loud opera singers and operettas and sacred and secular music in my house and at concerts, but they didn't influence me musically. Lost me as far as being around music. Musically, I like always like listening to radio, and I still like listening to radio. Good stations, you know, the stuff that plays a lot of new stuff and plays a lot of our stuff. Any one particular person more than anybody else? Mm. I was like Roy Orbison a long time ago, Bruce Chanel, Orlans. They all had low voices and like that. How about you, Robin? Well, I guess um, my father probably influenced me because he was also a musician. He played organ. And uh, he played keyboards, piano, and all that. Uh, and radio, again, between the time of, like, 1959 and 65, I guess. Uh, 59, because my sister had a record player, and I used to go in and take her records when she wasn't around and play them on her player, scratch the crap out of them, you know. But I'd, she had, like, Elvis, all Elvis's records, and... She was listening to like Eddie Cochran and uh, she was you know, cool. Sam Cooke and she had a bunch of cool stuff. Twisting and I don't know, stuff like that. Then of course the Beatles, the Kings and the Who and the Stones and and all that music that everybody was influenced by at that time. Yeah, we I don't think we ever had anybody we're no different than anybody else. We <laughs> we heard the same records you did except instead of uh, you know, taking another sort of job, we just stuck with music. Yeah. John? No, I, I agree with that. It's pretty, the radio, there's so many bands, you know, you're influenced by everything you hear, you know. Do any of you have plans for any solo projects? Sure, we all do. Sure, we all have uh, plans for solo, solo okay, I can't even say it. We all have plans for solo projects, uh, but not at this time. Cheap Tricks takes up most of our time because we tour 90% of the year and we record the rest of the time. We don't ever take vacations. This is a vacation to us to be able to sit here and talk to you. 
and do a TV show or something like that. Well, this certainly has been a real treat for us. It really has? Yeah. I mean, you're sick of us already, so we yeah. have to go off camera. <laughs> I think, well, Let's go no. out and have a party. I think See, we like to go party idea. and have a good time. Yeah. yeah. With the yeah. cameramen and with the people here and all our fans. We <clears> See, <throat> if, if uh, Chief Trick was to disband tomorrow, we could all just be yeah. professional party people. I think that's the thing. We'll go to parties and uh, you can rent us for a f small fee and all the beer we can drink. We'll show up at your house. Right. You know, it'd be sort of like stand around. Hi. Tonight. We want to know something. What part, if any, do you want to play in the current video revolution? Uh, heavy question. What, was that? <laughs> what part do we want to play in the new video revolution? Current video revolution, yeah. Hmm, the video revolution? You see yourself more into video than we're, in uh, we're a very visual band, so I think we can uh, we can bridge the gap between music and video. Most bands, I feel, uh, it's like video killed the radio star. You know that tune? All right, I, yeah, I think it's, it's, it really has in many ways because most groups aren't visual enough, so they have to end up using animation. They have to use every gimmick to get their music across, where I think... We just rely just on the group, and I think that's that's the best video. Well, radio will always be around. It's, it's killed the crummy radio star. Yeah. Which is good for business, really. Good riddance to bad rubbish. Takes out all the crap. Not all the crap. We're still yes. on. That was Cheap Trick's latest video, She's Tight. Stay with us for more. <laughs> FMTV continues with Nat King Cole, his daughter Natalie Cole, Bob Marley, Duke Ellington, and Astonishing oh, Odyssey. Nat King Cole recorded his first record in 1939. Here, filmed in 1951, I we see him performing you, I Love You for Sentimental Reasons. Nat King Cole died in 1965 at the age of 48. His daughter Natalie, now a star herself, is seen here performing When a Man Loves a Woman. Hang on, FMTV continues with more of Bob Marley. Well, yes. Everything, you see the music say death to black and white oppressors, to all oppressors, you know, we are dealing with human beings, we are dealing with the purpose why God created man in the first place, and how man should live, and we, these people, want to live like how God said man should live, and through reggae music, we convey our message because it's a lot of people not living that way. That, that them don't want to live that way, but they're forced to live that way. So the music comes to change, you know. The music comes to change the whole idea. I don't know how long it's going to take, but as is what I am. All music is root music that comes from Jamaica, you know, that sense of creativeness. See? Once it creates, it's root music. If it's a follow thing, then it's not root. But we are dealing with the creativeness, the creative power. You know, I know how tight you get rockers, reggae, rock steady, every music, but a creativity, which is roots. Well, reggae music is a music created by Rasta people, and it carry earth force, a people rhythm, and people, you know, it's a rhythm where people working, people moving, you know. Well, we play music, you know. And we don't play for suit critics. We play what we want to play, when we want to play it, how we want to play it. And we have a reason why we play it, you know? Yes, it is necessary to understand the lyrics, you know? It has meaning to, you know? But it's because some people, some people understand the words, you know? Some people never go through them situations, you know? But the of the world suffer, the masses of the people suffer, and this music comes from the masses of the people. You know, it don't really come from up class. 
Don't go away. FMTV will continue with another flashback to 1951. Duke Ellington is seen here performing Sophisticated Lady, which was written about 1939 and recorded in 1940 by Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn. Twenty years later, the Broadway show Sophisticated Ladies, based on Duke Ellington's original composition, won two Tony Awards. FMTV now continues with Astonishing Odyssey, featuring Michelle Legrand conducting the Montreal Symphony Orchestra with a laser video light show produced by Ron Haynes.